This meeting is being recorded. Um, this year we plan to address the um, elephant in the room, so welcome everybody. In past meetings, the new discussions have been often diverted when someone expresses an opinion regarding young earth creation or old earth creation. Um, as the minister responsible for herding cats, it's been my job to move the discussion back onto the original topic. But this is an important issue that won't go away by pushing it under the carpet. So this year, we're going to give it a fair bit of attention. Now, all Christians are creationists, ultimately, of some sort, but they disagree on how or when. Roughly, opinions fall within the following groups. First of all, there are young earth creationists who believe that the six days in Genesis 1 should be interpreted as six literal 24-hour days. Hence, the age of the earth and usually the rest of the universe is just a few thousand years old. This view is argued by Creation Ministries International and Answers in Genesis. On the other hand, there are old earth creationists and, um, uh, and mainstream science claims that the earth is approximately 4.543 billion years and the universe is approximately 13.77 billion years. Uh, some uh, old earth creationists believe that God intervenes miraculously in the development of life, whereas theistic evolutions, evolutionists, are another branch of old earth creationists, and they believe that evolution proceeds mainly through natural causes. The time frames between the YEC and OEC positions, which are abbreviations for young and old earth creationists, differ by approximately a million to one. So at least one opinion must be diabolically wrong. So this year, people can express and argue yes. their opinions on both the science and the okay, biblical right, interpretation, and will hopefully, hopefully listen to each other in a respectful and empathetic way. So tonight we have Steve White, who will present um, scientific evidence or a case for a young earth, and I'll now hand it over to him. So thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Kevin. Well put. I felt you've uh, really uh, sketched out what we're planning to do for this year. Um, as it turns out, I've got well over 40 slides, so I'm going to try and keep them fairly flowing. Uh, don't delay too much. Uh, you'll note there on the front slide, yes, I only have a graduate degree in science. It was actually sponsored by the Air Force uh, as part of Melbourne University course some time ago. Uh, largely physical sciences, um, nuclear physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, um, and a few others I can think of without meteorology, uh, and so forth. Having said that, I then went on to an Air Force career for about 20 years. Uh, much of it was actually uh, spent over here in South Australia on the Orion, uh, what was then the Orion Squadrons, um, looking for the Soviet fleet during the Cold War, and tracked them across the Indian Ocean. Then I left the Air Force settled down here in Adelaide, uh, and then got into flight testing. And I guess that's part of the framework in which I approach. We would test an aircraft before it was modified, knew exactly what it was before it underwent modifications, then proceeded to do the modifications, and then tested again with exactly the same tests to verify the before and after conditions. So we knew exactly what we changed on it and what performance problems or whatever we may have caused. So I guess that's where I'm coming from. That's the sort of activity that I'm used to. So just a brief outline, um, and I'm, I'm, even so, I'm not gonna be able to squeeze as much as I wanted into the hour. We'll talk about the Age of Enlightenment and its geology. Uh, and I do thank um, uh, Gordon Stranger for actually giving much of this outline because he'll be speaking next week and he'll be basing it on much of the same outline. We'll talk a bit about naturalism and uniformism or catastrophe. Naturalism and uniform or catastrophe is the, the two diametrically opposed views that we have. Isotopic evidence, and then we'll look at astronomical and chemical evidence. I just quickly want to remind ourselves what uh, we've been through in the last, uh, in the, well, no, first of all, prior to the Age of Enlightenment about 200 years ago. The Hindus, um, their particular calendar, gives the age of the Earth at about 2 billion years, and you've got the reference down there, uh, based on astronomical observation. 
The Han Chinese believed in destruction and recreation about every 23.6 million years. The Quran says the earth was made in two of six time periods, roughly aligning with the, uh, the six time periods that we see in Genesis chapter one. But they don't give a specific definition. And those who believe in the old age who are, um, um, are Muslims can say, oh, well, 4.5 billion years multiplied by three comes out to about 13.5 billion years. So they can agree that the, um, I guess, the modern science agrees with them in terms of that ratio. Finally, and I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying devout Jews and Christians believe in the creation of the earth about 4,000 BC based on the Bible genealogy of the descendants from Adam who was created on the sixth day of the universe. And I did hear Evans suggest uh, answers in Genesis and uh, creation ministries, but it's not just those. I took this today from the Jerusalem Post. Here's the banner on top of the Jerusalem Post. Six days it comes out every week. Of course, they don't come on the Sabbath. And yes, there's our Western date there, 2022. But over here on the right-hand side in the banner, 9th of Adar 5782. And the reference down the bottom there is to the uh, rabbi who sketched it all out using the genealogies, just as Christians do. Now, there are some differences between Christians and the Jews for various reasons. I think we'll delay that to uh, when we talk about the biblical interpretation. We might say there's probably an extra 200 years on the top. But, hey, it's much closer to 6,000 years than it is to 4.5 billion. So it's not just uh, little ministries in the Christian. Uh, every six days, uh, certainly Jerusalem Post, the English language, uh, Israeli newspaper, and I'm fairly sure the Hebrew language posts also come out with a date as well. Age of Enlightenment, what, what I mean by that? Some years ago, uh, a chapter of Reasonable Faith, Dr. Lim Long, one of our esteemed uh, uh, lecturers, uh, philosopher, and also a doctor of medicine, traced the deist philosophy of very distant, uninvolved gods down from the ancient Greek Epicureans. Some of you may remember that Paul debated with them when he was in Athens. From about the mid 1700s, this um, vague recollection or vague reference to possibly some God somewhere way in the past morphed into enlightened atheism where naturalism and man's reason eliminated any recorded revelation of past history. When I say revelation, I'm meaning revelation of uh, that was outside man's reason. In 1793, the French Revolution replaced the week of seven days, one of which was of rest, by a decade of 10 days with one and a half days rest to remove any reference to the Bible's six days of creation and one day of rest. Now, by 1805, though, Napoleon had to reverse that as laborers complained of overwork. Having said that, you actually got a bit more rest out of 10 days with one and a half days rest than you did have seven, but for all that, in that labour intensive era before machines were helping at all, seven days became the norm. The Paris Commune tried to introduce something for about 18 days in 1870 and then gave up. Now I'm going to try and link this to the next slide as we get into the Age of Enlightenment about two Scotsmen. The next Olympics are going to be held in 2024, 100 years earlier, 54 years after the French Revolution sorry, after the Commune, they were held in 1924. Some of you might remember the film that showed uh, that Great Britain was really hoping that a young Scotsman was going to win the 100 metres. However, a short time before those particular Olympics in 1924, the uh, program came out and he saw that the heats for the 100 metres were being held on a Sunday, the seventh day, which for Christians, uh, was the day they devoted to the Lord, and he refused to participate. Uh, there was great uh, consternation, great dismay in Britain that he wasn't going to run and win them that gold medal. However, he did have his name down for another event, but he was well down the world rankings for that event. And there was little of any expectation that he'd, he'd be able to do anything there. I think many of you will know the story. He then ran in the, that 400 metres race 
and despite an awkward gate, came through and won the gold medal. Might I suggest that had he compromised on his belief in the seven days, he may well have got fame uh, and won the 100 metres and maybe was known for maybe one or two more Olympics, but we probably would have forgotten him then. I can assure you that my grandfather, not a particularly religious man, told me the story of the man who refused to run on the Sabbath, but then won the 400 metres uh, in 1960. And of course, in 1975, a British um, director who'd made, I believe, a number of uh, X-rated movies wanted to make uh, a more noble movie. And he chose to tell the story of that Scotsman, Eric Liddell. And uh, mind you, I'm just reminded 1975, it was after the social revolution of the, the 60s, after the uh, Woodstock, um, after LSD, after the hippie movement. And then we saw the story portrayed in movie of a man who put his faith in the Lord's creation of seven days before anything else. And his, in fact, even I remember the, uh, the 2012 uh, opening series of the London game still had a small clip from that particular movie. So, yes, Eric Little is one Scotsman. Now let me turn to the other Scotsman, Sir Charles Lyle. Scottish lawyer by profession and eloquence, very, very persuasive. Geologist by a hobby and interest, you couldn't earn money as a geologist in those days. And he was influenced by James Hutton, who actually died on the year that uh, Sir Charles was born, 1797. He observed the fine sedimentary layers exposed on cliff faces, and I think his, uh, the first cliff face was in the Firth of Forth, uh, that's up near Edinburgh, and deduced at the current rate of erosion, um, relatively gentle Scottish rain and mist and so on, landforms must have taken limitless years to lay down. He also, to be fair, he didn't just stop at the sedimentary layers. He went and examined the volcanoes in Etna and Vesuvius and deduced the current rate of eruption. They also took millions of years to grow. He proposed we must judge the world's geology by the current climate and conditions, ignoring any likelihood of previous catastrophes. In fact, this is really in, I guess, certainly in the English speaking world where long ages really gained its traction. But his motives were not objective. Uh, by 1840, there was evidence uh, arising and, and being mentioned of an ice age. When he heard about this evidence, he called it an unacceptably catastrophic deviation from the university, a uniformity rather, of an earth in steady state, or at least in an extremely slow or long-waved cyclicity. He could not accept that something as uh, extreme as an ice age could be accepted. And then there's another one I've got here. In fact, this, I, I don't want to impute too many motives, but he certainly said, wrote to the Quarterly Review, a scientific journal, what will free science from Moses? And those, those of you who may not know, Moses was uh, reputed to have written the opening five books of the Old Testament, including the story of creation in Genesis and also of Noah's flood. If we don't irritate, and this is my words in italics, the church, which I fear we may, we shall carry all with us. So if you read his words, particularly his rejection of the uh, Ice Age, and indeed you can probably read between the lines on his idea to uh, blow away any acceptance of the biblical account of creation, uh, then those were his underlying uh, purpose. The first volume, The Principles of Geology, and I'm afraid I've only got a copy of the, the third volume, but the first volume was given to Charles Darwin by Captain Fitzroy as they set out, on, as he set out on his voyage in the Beagle. So you can see there, um, certainly Darwin got into what uh, Charles Lyle was writing about. Now, I want to talk about someone else who I heard now about almost four years ago, maybe it was three and a half, I think, I had a presentation um, from a ge geomorphologist, a river flood geologist named Dr. Ron Meller. Uh, he reported that he examined modern flood events around the world and observed that such floods leave a sedimentary layer averaging about 20 centimetres. 
No, it's not that much. 20 centimetres, perhaps about that much when spread over large areas. Yes, there might be a few extra lumps here and there, but largely each flood today, we're going to talk about uniformism. 20 centimetres is what you'll get. It would hurt, well, certainly not going to bury an elephant, uh, nor many other larger animals before they themselves are eaten by other predators or insects and fleas and all the other things that um, eat dead flesh. So there's no, the fossil record, if we're going to apply uniformism, the, the fossil record is certainly going to be not applicable to many large animals. And sorry, I'm going to talk, it was, <laughs> the timing of this uh, particular talk couldn't have been uh, more appropriate in the sense of uh, catastrophic events. I'm sure you all saw that big bang. What about, uh, we're probably talking almost a month ago, I think it was the 15th or 16th of January. Uh, for what is the top right picture is what the island had grown to off uh, Tonga. Uh, but uh, after a significant part of the eruption, it had then disappeared in two. And I believe where I've circled on there, that's all that's left now after the really big bang that you see on the left there. So yes, catastrophes do occur. It's only been a, well, about a month, less than a month, since we just saw one just across the, uh, uh, not far from us. I remind you of another catastrophe, probably the biggest one we know visibly, and to be fair, as Charles Lyle probably never got to visit um, Mexico or to see the huge crater we now know exists just there in the Gulf of Mexico. I forget, 30 or 40, 50 kilometres wide. It would have been a huge extinction event in some, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert in this, but some I've heard reported say that extinct, that when that meteorite hit there, it probably resulted in the extinction of many, 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 uh, many animal types uh, throughout the world. And probably the, the atmosphere was blown to uh, huge amounts of water vapour and it, will, it really would have been a catastrophic event. So with due respect, and I know Sir Charles didn't visit there, there's strong evidence that we have had catastrophic events on Earth that markedly changed what we know. Uh, one that I remember as I was growing up as I probably know, I was probably only about 11 or 12, the island of Circe. Uh, it was a volcano, came out of the ocean off Iceland in 1963, but within 20 years, what was just a grey, it was a hot volcano, cooled down, and there you can see images that it grow, grew um, vegetation and topsoil, all within 20 years. So we're not talking about millions of years, we're talking just a few decades before you can have landforms with topsoil, vegetation all on top. And I'll just show some pictures of the erosion that we see. I'm sure we're all familiar with erosion, but you'll notice that the topsoil tends to bind together at the top there and there. Uh, and yet you can see patterns of marks of, uh, uh, of where the water has flown down through channels and eroded. So you expect to see after a short while uh, to see these jagged bits where the erosion has taken place. Um, I'm going to now show one picture. There are many pictures around of uh, deep river valleys with, uh, or not this river valleys, I'm thinking of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and indeed, the, my, my wallpaper on my, my computer just to, up till today showed the White Cliffs of Dover, all with pictures of sedimentary layers uh, going through here. I, I chose this one because I went on again back in 2017 as we're going along the tour along the Catherine River here. Uh, the commentator on board was saying this uh, particular canyon took millions of years to form. Well, on what I've just shown you about erosion, about topsoil, I really can't see any topsoil lays anywhere along there. I can't see any real evidence of erosion uh, apart from the odd jagged bit there. Uh, but within the layers themselves, no um, up and down layers. And certainly if you look at pictures of the Grand Canyon uh, or indeed the White Cliffs of Dover, all you see is these very, very straight lines of sediment. There was no erosion between them, it appears, and certainly no topsoil, which could easily have formed within, um, the example of Circe, within 20 years. So it does appear that these layers must have been laid down, and many of them are much greater than 20 centimetres, 
Layers must have been laid down quite rapidly, one after the other, perhaps as a precipitation from huge floods. I'm using the word plural, I'm not talking about a particular flood, but certainly wherever they occur, they seem to be laid down without any indication of any interval between these layers being laid down. No sign of topsoil, no sign of any erosion between the striated and straightened layers. I'll keep on the Australian thing, given we're broadcasting from Australia, Simpsons Gap. Um, and of course, there's a Todd River flows through another gap up there near Alice Springs. Today's observed rate of erosion would have made this range water a watershed between streams flowing in the opposite direction. You would have a stream flowing towards us, more or on that riverbed there, but you would have expected that range to have been up there and then it would have flown in the opposite direction down the other side. I believe we've had some big floods recently. But it's, they still wouldn't have forced a river to flow through that, gore, through that range. But instead, the only logical explanation we see for uh, this big gap in this, uh, this hill or range of hills has got to have been a huge flood. No other, one should be flowing out, the other flowing, or flowing the other way, but a big flood's the only thing that could have broken through there. And not only that, there are ranges throughout the world pierced by rivers indicating that worldwide super flooding occurred. Not what Charles Lyle observed. And just one other canyon I'll give you. This is the Little Grand Canyon um, down near Mount St. Helens when after it erupted in 1980. The river that flew, flowed next to uh, St. Helens when it erupted in 1980 was blocked by all the ash deposits when the volcano blew up. And then a surge of mud came down and broke through and you've got this 40 meter and 45 meter wide canyon formed in just one day. Now, one of the other reasons, and yes, it's a biblical reason, why I uh, do reject uniformism because back about 65 AD, um, attributed to Peter, the apostle, wrote this um, particular piece in his, what we know as uh, the second epistle of Peter, chapter three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Not everyone believes in creation, but all things continue from the beginning. For this they are willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, and whereby the world was then, the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. Okay, so I'll just throw that in as a, I guess I was brought up biblical teaching, and to me, uh, something that is predicted from of old and then happens, whoa, someone knew this was going to happen. So it, it certainly has a ring of truth to it. So where are we at? Okay, well, I'm going to conclude now because we've got to move along very almost halfway through the time. There is evidence for great worldwide flooding events much greater than current day floods. You saw those gaps, Simpson Gap and other places. Sedimentary layers appear to be laid down rapidly without any evidence of erosion or topsoil expected between layers if laid down at significant intervals. There is visible evidence of huge meteor craters and volcanoes that would have caused catastrophic and rapid effects on parts of the Earth's surface. Okay, so that's where I'll conclude for geology. Now let's turn to isotopic. This means isotopes. We're talking about radioactive measurements. Um, whereas Sir Charles Lyell was about 200 years ago when he proposed the geological old age, the idea of dating by radioactivity is about 100 years ago. And a big shout out um, to Josh, um, one of the most famous Kiwis of all time, Sir Ernest Rutherford, uh, pioneered the measurement of the atomic nucleus using alpha particle beams. As I say, this was about 100 years ago. Just a reminder for what we're talking about here. We have a radioactive element, in this case, potassium-40, which is what I'll be speaking about mainly. 
It disintegrates uh, with a half-life of about 1.3 billion years. And what happens then, it, it goes into two other um, elements. One is argon-40, a neutral gas, which um, like helium doesn't cling to anything else. So you can find if, if it's there, it's, not, it's going to be relatively free. It's not going to be joined to any other element. It's going to be, a, a, it's a noble gas that doesn't interact because it's in it, when it's in its um, full form, it's got a fully um, enclosed uh, electron shell. I think it's eight electrons, which doesn't need to share with any other element. The only other product is calcium 40. And I think there might be a few other small part electrons. There we go. We've got some electrons that shoot off to uh, make that product. And as you can see, it's uh, right at the beginning when uh, potassium would start to disintegrate. You'd have, um, no, there'd, be, it, there'd be no time elapsed. But gradually, over time, as more and more argon uh, appears and the potassium reduces, you get a ratio. In fact, this is the one that we can use. Um, this particular stage, half of the uh, product is still potassium, and the other half is turned into argon, and it should be 1.3 billion years before that happens. And I'll just briefly throw this one up. One of the other um, radioactive products that is often used uh, is uranium. Uranium, as we know, is radioactive. Uh, it has a, well, thorium is another uh, related uh, element, and they all end up coming out as lead in the end. So I just thought I'd throw those in. Let's briefly pause to talk about what I know of science, not from my own particular experience, but as a, as a practice in this particular field, but what I've been through. I have diabetes, and I offer myself as a guinea pig to bouts of uh, five bouts of medical research uh, at Adelaide University over the last 10 years. This involved taking my blood and breath samples every 15 minutes for about four hours. After taking infusion, I mean, I was given infusion of substance uh, such as protein to check if it restricted the rise in my blood sugar before and after I took a high carb carbohydrate drink. They're trying to work out, is there anything that can uh, reduce my blood rise of my blood sugar. When I asked the researchers if I was a controlled subject taking the placebo or the active ingredient of the test, I was told neither the researcher or the laboratory testing my blood and breath knew that. The researchers explained this was a double blind separation of results to prevent any human bias on the interpretation of the outcome. And look, I took due note of that. And that's, that's very rigorous, and I fully approve of that sort of rigor at not trying to double guess what they should end up with. Now I'm going to, oops, uh, yes, I've got something here. Applying, now let's just try the same sort of rigor to isotopic dating. In 1992, samples of a seven, kilogr uh, seven kilogram block of dacite from a post 1980 Mount St. Helens extrusion. That's that little lump of lava which rose out after that huge eruption. Just a reminder for folks, uh, what happened at Mount St. Helens, it actually blew out partially sideways, uh, not straight up, but partially sideways. You can see this big valley where that side of the mountain blew outwards, but it, a bit of the lava after the eruption came up to the top. Uh, the extrusion was sent to a reputable Geochron Laboratories of Cambridge, Maryland for car, uh, potassium, sorry, potassium, that's the simple potassium argon dating. In other words, the ratio that we just saw on the previous slide. The only information provided to the laboratory was that the samples came from dacite and that low argon should be expected. In other words, they were warned. This is a quite recent sample. The laboratory was not told the specimen came from a lava dome at Mount St. Helens and was only 10 years old. They weren't told that. Much as my medical experiment uh, when I was going through research for diabetes, the researchers did not know, the laboratory did, did not know about whether I was taking the controlled substance of placebo or I was taking the real active ingredient. So this is what came back a 10 year. Uh, we knew that the lava had only just solidified sometime after the 1980 eruption. They actually, when they sent away the samples, they actually took some of the minerals out of it, and took them separately. And you can see here, it came out, uh, that's uh, in fraction of millions of years. So 
350,000 years for the whole rock, 340,000 for feldspar, all the way up to 2.8 million for pyroxene. The conclusion is, now this is where we've got to be careful here, that they measured argon gas. Remember, what is showing is they estimate, and I'll just quickly go back. Ah, too much, here we go. What they're really saying is, they're way down this line here somewhere because there's a lot of argon in this substance. And so they're saying, oh, you know, you're getting right down that line somewhere. Whereas in fact, that wasn't the case. So the conclusion is that the measured argon gas had entered the samples while the magma was state before the sample solidified into a closed state. Just a reminder, the argon is trapped in there once the minerals solidify into crystals and have a crystal structure that traps the argon for a limited time before it leaks out. In the molten state, which it would have been before then, obviously argon would have been circulating and the uh, radioactivity would have been occurring in the molten state, but they were not trapped in these solid samples. Thus, the existing methods of measuring surface igneous rock by carbon, uh, uh, potassium, sorry, argon dating, greatly exaggerates the age of the surface. In this case, the whole rock about 35,000 times. Now, and I, I thank Kevin for this. He did point out the people, you know, the, the old age people looked at this and said, a critic of uh, this particular blind age test says the Geochrom Laboratories advertise it cannot measure any sample reliably under 2 million years old. Okay, fair cop. But I want to ask the question, how does the laboratory or indeed even the person providing the sample know if the sample is more than 10, 2 million years old? How would you know that? Uh, and in any case, the test that we did provide proved that much argon has got into the sample before it solidified, a point that is applicable to all samples being measured, no matter how old they were. So the presence of the, the what we call the daughter product of the radioactivity was already much in excess of what would have been due just to the radioactivity. Now, again, hoping that uh, Josh was here, I thought I'd throw up this slide and for all those who might be J.R.R. Tolkien fans, that's Mount, well, commonly known as Mount Doom. I think uh, Josh will not have pronounced it in its Maori name, Mag Narahoi. Um, but there, yeah, just some other samples. Again, you can see the dates of the eruptions. They knew where the eruptions, they knew place of where the lava was from each of those eruptions. Again, you'll see the potassium argon is well, up to 3.5 million years, some of them a bit less, 0.8. Perhaps there's one there about 27,000 years. So, yep, it's all there. Now, I want to talk as a contrast with my own experience of having medical science uh, scientists. Dr. Nella, in his 2018 presentation, said that as an academic researcher, he and others were advised to select up to 10 samples for isotropic dating at each site he was investigating. Other colleagues gave this advice to ensure that a, a suitable sample, a suitable date that best met their expected outcome could be found. I um, find that somewhat alarming. You're not supposed to come with an expected outcome. You are supposed to take the evidence as it arrives, as the medical scientists did. Uh, and I might just quickly mention that Dr. Miller, many people say, oh, you young earth uh, creationists, yeah, well, you brought up, you're brainwashed uh, by, you know, by you, when you're grown up. Not Dr. Neller. He came from a fractured home, had no interest at all in the religion. Uh, he didn't have the uh, scores to get into uni. He went there and just pleaded and someone took pity on him and let him go in. He would do anything and he would take the advice. He would uh, take the bias as required in order to come to the theory that was expected. Now let's look at another uh, example. Richard Leakey, again, quite by coincidence, Richard Leakey sadly died just at the beginning of January. He's, he was sons of famous um, archeologists, uh, his parents, 
And he found pieces of human skull in Kenya along with some pig and elephant fossils. Previous isotopic dating of an ash layer at the site, right on where the, um, the, the, ele the uh, items of the fossils were found, had been measured about 212 to 230 million years. The theory of human evolution, however, dictated the skull was about 2.9 million years old. The first isotopic result was discarded. Here's the hard evidence, but you discard it. As it was claimed, it was contaminated by older rock fragments. The skull was then precisely, and these are the words from the, um, th uh, from the uh, scientific uh, papers, precisely dated to 2.6 million years by four isotopic and two fossil theory estimates. The scientists who specialised in human evolution objected to this precise age because the skull looked too modern. The pig evolution, evolutionists claimed it would be more like 1.8 million years. They revised this precise, these precise methods and discarded one of them to get a date of 1.6 to 1.8 million years, a 40% reduction of the previous precise date. We know all this manipulation. It's not, we just didn't make it up. Because there was so much controversy, it was actually in scientific literature. It was out there for the world to see. In the end, peak evolution theory controlled the selection of isotope measurements and trumped the theory of human evolution. I've got the reference there if you wish to go. Yes, it was a creation magazine, but uh, you will find that old age folks will not... Uh, um, well, if I may use uh, Al Gore's expression, will not uh, use inconvenient truths about their own measurements. So isotopic conclusion, rigorous forms of science such as medicine ensure laboratory measurements eliminate human bias in arriving at the results. This does not appear to be the case in geology or paleontology. Paleontology is the dating of those fossils. The blind test of radioactive dating at Geochron Laboratories shows that there is no reliable way to know how much daughter isotope was in any sample before it solidified on the surface, greatly exaggerating the measured age of a rock sample of any age. As I just you know, when I introduced myself, I said, look, I'm used to dealing with modifications of aircraft. You know what you've got before you start the change and you measure it afterwards. You know your, your baseline and you go, and find out what happens afterwards. Okay, so we'll lead now and go on to astronomical and chemical evidence of life. I'm going, because we're moving along 20 minutes left, I'm going to not go into too much detail. I'm gonna talk about Saturn. Um, this is a Cassini was the name of the rocket that left here in about uh, 1997 to investigate Saturn and its moons. It carried a European Huygens probe he was a famous scientist to touch down on the planet Titan, which was shrouded with an atmosphere largely of methane and nitrogen, but there were also some other organic compounds in there as well. <clears throat> Cassini entered Saturn's orbit in 2004 and detached Huygens for a successful landing on Titan. I'm a bit of a space nerd, so I was following this and interested to see what they find. And there's a picture of what they expected to find on Titan. At the time of the launch, NASA commissioned images of the expected surface of Titan showing seas and oceans of ethane covering much of the moon's surface, as seen here in this daily mirror image of 2010. I had to you know, do a Google search to find out. Uh, there used to be some that dated back to 1997 at launch, but I could not find them anywhere now. But they certainly were like this. They were representative of this. There were certainly lots of oceans. Yes, and there were some landforms in the background, but certainly plenty of um, seas and oceans. <clears throat> now, Rather than staying my own time, I'm going to quote from the NASA scientists, and this is for new scientists. Ethane is produced in Titan's atmosphere by the breakdown of methane, which is abundant there. Before NASA's Cassini spacecraft space reached uh, Titan, scientists expected this ethane to accumulate in huge amounts, perhaps forming oceans of liquid ethane mixed with uh, liquid methane, ethane, liquid ethane, methane mixed. The amount expected, and later in another slide you'll see it was 4.5 billion years, would have covered the entire moon in a layer of ethane 300 metres deep. We think that ethane is raining or, if temperatures are cool enough, snowing on the North Pole right now, said Caitlin Griffiths from the University of Arizona. When the season switch, we expect ethane to condense 
at the South Pole during its winter. <clears throat> in the process described by her team, has been at work. Uh, if the process described by her team had been at work since Titan formed, you know, that's again just my notes in italics, a layer of ethane two kilometres thick should have formed at the poles, she says. But if we look at the South Pole, we don't see evidence for that amount of ethane that we would need to have if the methane was in the atmosphere over the lifetime of Titan. I should explain to new scientists. This is what they actually found. We expected to see oceans. We got this. That's what the photograph from Huygens showed. And it was a dull flood. There was no splash. During many flights, that was just a one-off landing. I only probably sent a few weeks up before it uh, ceased. But Cassini came back from many flybys. In fact, Cassini was only um, crashed into Saturn probably only five or six years ago. So it, it, it flew around um, uh, Saturn and its moons for about 10 years. During many flybys of Titan, Cassini's instruments imaged the Titan surface. There was only a few lakes in the polar regions, just there, you can see on the bottom left, with, and just here on the right, with dunes, not lakes, but dunes of organic compounds coated with acetylene ice in the equatorial regions. And indeed, what can I say here? This is the words, the word enigma. Uh, in fact, it's, it's obvious what uh, the lack of methane, the presence of methane in Titan's atmosphere is one of the major enigmas the Cassini Huygens mission to Saturn system is trying to resolve. They noted science have long known that Titan's atmosphere contains methane, ethane, acetylene, and many other hydrocarbon compounds. But sunlight irreversibly destroys methane after tens of millions of years. So something has replenished methane in Titan's thick air during the moon's 4.5 billion year history. But as they admit, it's a major enigma. How come so much methane remains in the atmosphere if Titan is 4.5 billion years old? And then the sands, so I talked about the dunes that are in uh, the, pole, uh, the uh, equatorial regions. Scientists were able to recreate uh, growth of benzene, naphthalene, and yeah, I'm not going to pronounce that one, prospective building blocks of organic gym material by stimulating exposure of acetylene isis to cosmic rays. The process was so efficient, they were able to get these material to form in a lab over time periods, extrapolated time conditions for, from about 10 to 100 years. So you can start producing dunes, yeah, at, uh, at least uh, by 100 years or so. Therefore, this study reveals that even over a relatively short time scale of 104 years, uh, those names for the uh, dune compounds as complex as that particular name can be synthesized on Titan's surface. Let's switch from um, Titan and now look at another moon. Enceladus, I think I might got the pronunciation about right, is a one seventh the diameter of our moon. And if you look over here on the left, you can see these great jets of icy matter coming, of supersonic jets emitting from its South Pole. And that goes on to create, and there's uh, the rings creates, uh, the science say creates Saturn's E ring. Saturn's moons, Mimas, Tethys, Dione, and Rhea, I hope I got the pronunciation right, are coated with ice from the E ring. Based on the depth of the ice found on these and uh, these other moons, scientists estimate the ice has accumulated from the E-ring in less than 200 million years. No, it's not 6,000 years, but it's a whole lot shorter than 4.5 billion years. If Enceladus is also spewing ice directly at these bodies, the radar albedo indicated these middle-sized satellites of Saturn are younger than previously thought. That complicates even further. The words young or youth appear 10 times in the October 2009 geophysical research letters. That's the reference at the bottom. Now let's look at the rings themselves. And there's a couple of references here. To be consistent with the observed clean rings, the rings of Saturn must be as young as 10 to 100 million years. The low value of the ring mass suggests a scenario where the present rings of Saturn are young probably just 10 to 100 million years old to be consistent with their pristine icy composition. Uh, very, uh, when pristine, we mean very clean. There's no dust that you'd expect if you were formed in the midst of the, well, the, the bombardment of um, 
uh, dust coming in particles from outer space or indeed um, the solar wind, you'd expect them to be polluted from that, but they're not, they're very clean. So what do I conclude from Cassini expedition? The Cassini mission to Saturn's Saturnian system has found evidence of moons and rings very much less than 4.5 billion years assumed for the solar system. In the case of Titan June, uh, Titan's dunes, this may only be 100 years or so. Okay, on to the final thing that I want to talk about, galactic dimensions. We've talked about our solar system as far as uh, Saturn was concerned. I just want to go a bit, well, right out into the galaxies. Quick reminder of uh, relativity. Einstein was brilliant. He uh, used this illustration of a train moving very fast along a line uh, with incidents happening uh, either in front or behind, but with a stationary observer relative to those same incidents. The timing of events we observe is affected by the relative speed between the events observers. The train is going at four fifths the time of the speed of light. An observer on a train moving that speed will observe the two lightning strikes at a much longer interval than that of the observer stationary with respect in this case, the lightning striking two trees. Time is much slower on the fast train. Similarly, when we get to uh, the general theory of re relativity, timing of events we observe is also affected by the relative gravitational field of the events and the observers at different places. Thus the young versus old universe argument must consider the relevant time dilation applicable to the observer with respect to the events to which he or she measure time, particularly at galactic uh, distances. For instance, I've seen one postulation that the Earth started in a very deep uh, gravity field close to perhaps where the singularity first burst into activity. Then uh, as the universe or rather as the uh, stars were formed and then moved out very rapidly, then the Earth in its deep well would have very slow time frame with respect to the stars that are spreading out rapidly. So what we observe today may well be affected by the early effects of where we of the Earth was at the time it was first formed. Now that's basic relativity. And finally, I'm going to end up with. Uh, a guy is fairly controversial because he too was telling an inconvenient truth or showing an inconvenient truth. Halt Marp, the US astronomer, is known for his atlas that he produced of galaxies that uh, he could see through one of the telescopes. In it, he presented images of galaxies apparently interacting with nearby cases, quasars. Now, the galaxies with a certain redshift the quasars were at a much greater redshift, and we should expect that. Quasars are much denser. They're almost like a neutron star, and they suck in. And then, look, I don't know, but you know, what do you, you believe in what you see? Here is this um, galaxy, and there's this stream of matter or gas or perhaps dust or whatever being dragged in the direction of what one might say well, maybe that's in the distance, but look, why does it just stop there? Why doesn't it go swinging past? If that quasar was much further away, why doesn't that arm proceed? And you see some of these other arms at other places, I mean, do you extend? Why does that arm suddenly stop, boom, as it gets to that? That to me, seeing is believing, is that that particular quasar is right at the same, you know, right in the same proximity to the galaxy. And yet the redshift there is much greater. But this contradicts the premise of the Big Bang, that a redshift is the measure of the distance for our observation here on Earth, and thus the measure of the edge of the universe in light years. Because if in fact redshifts is not due to distance, but due to such things as gravity, then yeah, well, who's to say that the uh, Big Bang, which among other things needs now have to have dark matter and, uh, and also dark energy, uh, this is just one more indication that uh, the Big Bang, as appealing as it might have appeared at the time, uh, does have some big holes in it. So where am I coming on this? The observed time of galactic events from Earth could be much less than assumed from the Big Bang model. 
Relativistic time dilation may mean Earth time is much less than, than oh God, I got that one wrong, less than it should have been read in distant galaxies. Oops, go back one. The assumption that redshift is a measure of distance to outer galaxies and thus of the age of the universe is contradicted by the appearance of proximate cases, quasars and galaxies with different redshifts. Okay, so now we're going to summarise what I've had. We're just coming up with about five minutes to go. A number of geological forms around the world indicate great flood events as well as rapid change from other catastrophic events. Radioactive isotope measurement, when checked against known historic events, grossly exaggerate the age of these events. The Saturn system and its moons exhibit quite young features that appear to contradict a 4.5 billion year solar system. The time observed at various points in the universe must allow for varying rates of time dilation to the observer, dependent on the relative speed and gravity between these points. Thank you. Sorry, I hadn't muted, unmuted my microphone. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and it is now open for people to ask questions or uh, make statements. Now, um, a lot of comments have come up in the chat. I could walk through them, but that does tend to be a little bit boring. So uh, for starters, I'll just uh, kind of open it up um, for those people who have actually um, want to comment uh, on what um, uh, uh, can Steve I just said. ask can I just ask um, about the catastrophic events I'm a bit confused yes. by that yes, um, yes. Um, the uniformitism could you just give me a definition of what that is and then just clarify why what catastrophic why why does catastrophic events mean uh, there's a young earth I don't know I'm just lost yeah okay now look I, well um, Right, and that's a very good point. I want to go back to why the old ages. Look, I, I'm coming from the old ages. It was actually Sir Charles Lyon. I brought up his screen. I don't know if you can see it there. Um, he said, oh, the you know, others probably before James Hutton as well, said, look, if we look at the world today, we can see the rate of how much um, air sediments has been laid down or indeed even volcanic um, being laid down, then we can say that that's a really takes a really long time for all that to be laid out. Um, but, and I'll just quickly go here, uh, but that he was based on what he could see, largely Europe. I don't think he went to the States, he might have, um, but certainly he was examining what he could see in Europe. Whereas we know that um, landforms do change, you know, just over there in Tonga. Suddenly all we've got left is a slight sliver of an island. And that happened rapidly. So I'm trying to say is that you cannot use geology uh, of uniformism to say that the earth is old because uh, uniformism is not what we observe. Um, yes, uh, we're fortunate that I, <laughs> well, no, probably not fortunate, but Tonga blew up uh, just a short time ago. And then again, I suspect uh, Charles Lyle didn't even go and know about this big crater, but look, many people, even probably old age people, say that that event on the Mexican uh, coast there uh, was, a, was a mass extinction thing. We know the earth changes very rapidly when you have big events like that. That's so right. you, yeah. you we did, we... I, don't, I don't understand how that, um, I mean, can't you have both? Like um, yes, some yes, things yes. form over time and other things catastrophic. Well, um, Mr. Charles Lyle didn't want to know about the ice age because it completely, well, he found it a contradiction. Yeah, oh, can I okay. point out that this whole uh, argument about yes. catastrophism versus yes. uh, uh, uniformitarianism, that's about 210 years old. I mean, yep. okay. the, uh, look, I, I agree. Just of, yes. long ago uh, understood that there is a basic uniformitarianism, if you like to call it that, uh, means of slow deposition of many, many different kinds of sediments at many, many different kinds of rates. 
and there are also additional catastrophic events, volcanoes, tsunamis, mudslides, mm. earthquakes, so that, you name it. There's no argument about this. This doesn't affect the, the estimates of the age of the Earth at all. Mm. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I look, well, it, uh, certainly, it, it certainly did, and certainly affected, um, it certainly affected um, um, Charles Darwin because he was given well, the book. Can I also say it's, it wasn't just Charles uh, Charles Lyell who was involved in this argument. Many, no. in fact, most of the the basic principles of geology were actually formed in Scotland, uh, sometimes in England and Switzerland, a few other places, largely yes. in Scotland. Many times not by people who are hostile to the Bible, but by people who were actually ministers in the Church of Scotland and who wanted to, who set out to try to demonstrate a literal six-day creation and they couldn't do it. And they eventually had to, to conclude that yes, indeed, the earth was extremely old because all the process studies show that the, the accumulations of all kinds of paleo environments and different kinds of sediments, you just cannot compress that into the short period of, of six days. That just doesn't work. I think it's the flood. We're talking about the flood here. Well, um, if you go back to that um, or, 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 even, or even the flood, um, yes. yeah, it, it doesn't work. I mean, to you're where, talking where, about... where's the topsoil please gordon where's the topsoil where are the of uh, any i mean this is probably not as good as um the grand canyon where you can see such straight lines of each of the sedimentary layers where's yes, your and also and also in the grand canyon if you look carefully yes uh, which uh, most of these creationists appear not to you can see there are disconformities and unconformities okay. You actually, actually look for them. They're there, and those are gaps in the in the uh, the sedimentation rate, uh, which could themselves be millions of years. And you look at the uh, at the actual formations in the Grand Canyon, and you see that they are wind blown desert sand dune formations. Now, how can this be formed in the in a great flood? It's impossible. Okay, well, look, this is where I'm, I'm going to wait for Ron Neller to appear later because he is the specialist there. I won't say anything more than that. Uh, and as well, I said... Go, yeah, but if you go back to that meteorite, okay, yes. in young, yeah, let's go um, back there. I'm let's go back yeah, yeah. That's, I'm assuming uh, from a young Earth perspective, I can't even see how you could cater, that, cater for that because that would have wiped out pretty much the whole planet. Right, oh, and you're talking about absolutely. Absolutely. Right. tremendous. Look, yeah. I don't. You know, I don't so mind. it's only you can only use that meteorite yeah. in an older capacity because you need time to for things to re-establish. So I, I can't even see how that meteorite. No, it, what about the flood? Noah was in his ark at this time. He probably well, we think he was probably somewhere up near the Middle East. This would have been huge impact all around what's now North America and right across the Atlantic. I don't deny that. And, possibly out into the Pacific, but that's not where Noah was when he in the flood. He was up around over uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Oh, so you'll, so this is what the meteorite is a precursor to the flood. That's yeah, what I saying. mean, we know the, the well, flood. You, you read the account of flood in Genesis chapter six and you'll find all sorts of, you know, the earth was ripping up and <laughs> go see Russell Crowe's movie. Uh, yeah, all sorts of bad things were happening. And wait a minute, wait a minute. How can it be a precursor to the flood? Uh, when it wiped out the dinosaurs, which are about uh, uh, 80 80 percent through the, uh, the the evolutionary sequence that we see in the world, um, I didn't say it wiped out the dinosaurs. Gordon, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just saying had happened before that Chicxulub crater uh, and that impact occurred. If that had occurred, in your point of view, when you say that, though, Gordon, literal arc, the arc would have been demolished. No, or, or it would have caught fire because there's huge amounts of fire at that time. And oh, also, also, there's very good geochemical evidence of, the, uh, of, of that impact uh, having uh, geochemical ev uh, evidence all over the place, all over the planet, practically, um, from the, um, uh, what was it, one of the platinum group elements, which was in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I fully agree that it was, it was a world catastrophe. Absolutely agree. But um, did it stop an ark from sinking? A well-built ark? Look, Noah was told to prepare and in a sealed container. 
that, yeah, certainly probably rocked and rolled and pitched and whatever a ship does at the moment of that impact. And um, can I just ask a question? Like, um, um, oh, with Chexy Lab, we, um, you haven't actually stated how big <laughs> a meteorite was yeah. and how vast its extent was. Uh, so uh, it may be unrelated to any other things, but mm -hmm. according, what is your dating mm -hmm. of Chexy Lab? And what is the old earth dating of Chixi oh, Lab? Does anybody know? <laughs> I'll let Gordon. Do you want to answer that one, Gordon? Uh, I don't know the exact figure, but it's about 65 million years ago, yeah. So you're saying that this one was responsible for the dinosaur extinction? And a lot of other uh, um, yeah. animal yeah. species, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, look, I fully accept there was a mass extinction event. Um, my own personal view, um, and I'm... <laughs> Stick my neck out to be here, it probably occurred at the beginning of the great um, events that uh, great earthquakes, etc., that happened at about and may even be the result of this crater, might have been part of what created the great flood. Well, yeah, creationists always come up with this big arm waving about uh, great upheavals in Could the you earth. Waving your arms? Actually look at the details, look for the where is the detailed evidence. Yes. Yes, yeah. I look. Um, I will result. I will wait for a flood geologist, um, Ron Meller. All right, he's the guy that knows more about this than I do. All I'm trying to prove is that, um, the bias that initially started with Sir Charles Lyle has proven to be quite false, and that's quite why. And look, I'm sorry, Gordon, I took the uh. The order of the topics that uh, you broadcast, you're going to talk about. So fine, uh, we'll, we'll skip that all that stuff. But look, I, I will. How did Simpson Gap form then, please? Well, I haven't actually looked at it in detail, but it looks to me uh, very much like episodic incision, river incision, probably a superposition yeah. um, of the that when the landform was at the top of that cliff, there would have been a, 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 an ephemeral river starting off and the uh, as the river cut down, or was it rather as the land rose, the river cut down to meet it. That's, but that's very common in many parts of the world. It's not a problem at all. You don't have to invoke huge flood, uh, floods. To... Yeah, but you would expect it to flow in one direction, wouldn't you? Uh, well, we talk about, um, what do they call watersheds? Watershed yeah, where we all find one direction. Okay, so it, it, I don't quite follow where you're going with this. Well, um, I'm just saying that that does not look like a normal watershed where water would flow in one direction, for example, one slope, and then in a different direction, in a different no, river, no, stream no, no, in the other direction. That's, that's not how incision works. Uh, there's been a lot of tectonic activity up in the, in the central area there. We're talking about uh, a superimposed fluvial system which superimposed on the top level of those strata and it, as the as the hills or as the land arose the river continued its former uh, lineation and cut down through it uh, and you can see this in multiple places. There are some classic yeah. examples, yeah. Where, examples yeah. where rivers arise north of the Himalayas and cut through yes. the Himalayas and flow out yeah. to the south. Many, many such examples. I could show you examples on every continent where that's sure. happened. I, I fully agree. I fully agree. Yes, we, we see mountain ranges that are cut by rivers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Steve, I, uh, one thing that confused me is that, like, why did you say that the river flow had to be bidirectional through Simpson's oh. Gap? Okay, well, now I'm saying before the gap was formed, if this was a mountain range, as it is, you, you've seen the McDonald Ranges, the you know, big long stretch of rills. If, if, I guess most of you have been up to um, Alice Springs. And in fact, you, this is Simpson Gap is one, Todd River is the other one, where the, ra the road and the rail go through. You come up to this range, from a distance you can see it's quite a you know, reasonable straight line of hills, but you get to this point and suddenly there's this quite pronounced break in the hills, you would have thought the Todd River, um, or we know it flows into Alice Springs, you would have thought it would have uh, come from these hills and flowed down into Alice Springs and continued, whereas you would have thought on the southern side, as you're approaching Alice Springs from Adelaide, you would have expected a different river to be flowing down from those hills in the direction towards Adelaide. 
Yeah, but it's, it's, it's what's called a watershed. We see them all what, around the world. What we're talking about is consequent drainage. That means you, you have the, the landform, the hills, and you have consequent drainage developing on that landform. What, what I'm talking about is antecedent drainage, where the drainage pattern is established first, and then the hills rise and, the, and the, that drainage pattern is incised into it. It's absolutely not a problem. Okay, so we now have upthrust of those hills uh, due to geological movement. Okay, well, look, as I say, Gordon, I, I only took geology because it was the first step that we'd agreed in the general outline. Uh, I do defer to Ron Miller, as I say, he's the, uh, uh, the, the flood specialist who we hope to get invited to speak later in the year. Just going back to uh, Bronwyn's earlier question that started this conversation as to what catastrophism has got to do with the age of the earth or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think I pointed out in a comment that um, initially long age was built on a foundation of uniformitarianism. Yes, uh, that if everything runs at a uniform rate and we look at the rates things are happening now, we have to trace that back um, that many million years to get from an initial state to where we are now. Uh, and Lyle, as Stephen pointed out, uh, could not accept catastrophism because it interfered greatly with that and allowed for things to happen very, very quickly. And so the fact that we now do believe in catastrophism totally undermines the initial foundation of the whole theory. Of what theory, sorry? Of, of long age theory that's built on that foundation of... Um, but science, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, they find more clues for things. So, you know, like, yep. I, I don't, but to me, that doesn't, I don't, can't see how, I can't see how you can't have both. It's like you have catastrophes, but you also have things building up over. You had microbes that stayed on the earth for like 4 billion, what was it? Oh, the little microbes that just chewed and transformed all the iron that was sent here from outer space, the meteorites, and over millions of years, they transformed them into... Uh, that's an assumption um, based on uh, the belief in old age rather than an actual examination. <sighs> No, it isn't. It's based on the actual evidence. Yeah. There's, there's hard evidence. That they bunch for four billion years? Yes. Yeah. yeah, there is, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a few meteorites, but and this is where we get to the... If we're getting that into isotopism, then, and it's all based on whether isotope radiation um, no. is, in fact, accurate or not. No, it's not all based on that. Some of it but, is based on that. And what you talked about, Stephen, was... Uh, well, you mentioned uh, uranium lead and you mentioned potassium. Yes, yes, yes. Well, those yes. are just two of at least 50 of different of methods. Course, yeah. I agree. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Methods, yeah. Interconnected yeah. methods, methods which yield dates which are absolutely consistent with a whole host of other processes. Oh, well, I might mention the fact that when they were looking for hot rocks, I think it was Arizona, they took out some sample cores because they were down near an old volcano and uh, got them out and they lay in a laboratory for a little while and then someone took them and found uh, helium still inside them. Helium, helium is the most slippery and smallest gas molecule, but it was still inside these uh, from the radioactive, um, um, you know, from uranium uh, activity. So and there are contradictory things too. Which is why uranium helium as a radiometric dating method has long ago been abandoned, because I agree with you, helium, helium is, as you put it, a, a slippery element. Slippery, but, yes. Uh, there are much, much better ways. Now, you talked about potassium argon, uh, yes. specifically the potassium yes. argon in, yes. uh, in Mount St. Helens. Yes, yes. Um, and you actually gave those, uh, those dates. And uh, what was it, 0.35 million yep. years plus or minus 0.0. Yep. No, I'll just bring it up there. You can see that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, several points to make here. Firstly, um, uh, as you yourself pointed out, uh, any um, age determination using potassium argon, uh, because it, um, that transformation has such a very long uh, process, uh, half-life. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It, it, any um, uh, recent 
event is almost impossible to measure because the the amount of helium uh, uh, argon rather yeah. is absolutely minuscule and sure. most laboratories can't measure to that sort of uh, um, accuracy which as you rightly pointed out uh, one of the uh, one of the objections is that that particular laboratory just wasn't equipped to measure young ages like that but the main thing i want to point out is that daysite itself is not the appropriate rock type to use with this kind of method because daysite consists of, uh, well, it has three components. It has uh, xenocrysts, which, which is um, bits of country rock broken off and sort of falling into the magma, remelting and recrystallizing. That will give you one sort of, of error. It also have, it has phenocrysts, and you mentioned that, well, you've got 1.7 and 2.8 million years as the pyroxene dates. Yes. And that's perfectly reasonable, because what you're looking at is not the age of the eruption. What you're looking at is the age of the crystallization of pyroxenes, which are high temperature, uh, early crystallization things. And it is well known, very well known, very well established that in deep uh, magma chambers, it can easily take two or three million years for uh, those uh, early crystals to actually form. And what happens is that as the, uh, the high temperature minerals form and crystallize, the melt uh, gets uh, more and more uh, volatile compounds, it's concentrated and eventually becomes so concentrated that the lava uh, sort of works its way up um, explosively through the overlying strata and, and gives you an yeah. eruption. But you're not yeah. measuring the date of the eruption, you're, you're measuring the date of the crystallization of the phenocrysts. And another reason it doesn't work very well is that it has a glassy matrix, uh, which yes. is yeah. in, in which it's extremely difficult to actually retain argon, the original concentration of argon. So even if the laboratory was able to measure the argon at that incredibly low level, um, it wouldn't really mean anything because, you know, the glassy rock, uh, as in the whole rock there, um, that date is meaningless. Mm. So there's actually nothing at all, all wrong with these, no, uh, well, well you, you're telling me that all those minerals in hot magma, uh, and we've actually gone down into the mantles. So, uh, have we had a look at the? I thought they drilled the, some of the deep holes, but I don't know if they've ever got to the magma. So, how do we know? Have we actually measured these crystals in the temperature below the mantle? There have been, well, it's not below the mantle, it's actually in the lower crust. Yeah, the lower crust. Have we actually, because I know they've put some similar very deep the, holes of recent times, I mean, trying to get down to the Similar, by the way, to the, um, uh, the magma chamber beneath Yellowstone, which is producing all the geysers there and has been do doing since yeah. white men appeared. Um, we know that in that kind of environment, there are deep magma chambers. And we know from physics experiments Sorry. that these crystals grow extremely slowly and we know the order in which they grow and the temperature at which they crystallize and that the uh, the whole crystallization history of rocks like daysite um, has is is very well established it's it's not a mystery at all now wait a minute wait a minute in addition right. to the daysite there are other areas in the uh, other rock types in the same area which are volcanic ash flows. Now, these are suitable for potassium argon. They, they may even have come from, from the very same magma chamber, okay. uh, yeah. which is very easily long lived. And those have been measured at, I think it was about 22 million years by potassium argon, also by argon argon, also by rubidium strontium, also by uh, uranium lead and various other methods. You've got about half a dozen different uh, methods of dating that magma chamber and they're all interconsistent, absolutely interconsistent. So there's no problem about this. Now, this I'm is sorry. trying to, to create problems. No, 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 there's helium in actual samples taken independently from creations or anything because I'm trying to look for hot rock. 
uh, power system. I think it was Arizona, but certainly out there in New Mexico or somewhere, where they were sitting there in samples that they brought up. And against all expectations, there was quite measurable helium in there. Helium should have, you know, being the smallest um, atomic um, uh, gas should well and truly have gone way out, should not be measurable, but it was still there. The creationist stock in trade is to look at all the data on radiometric dating, and there are now hundreds of thousands, if not millions of such measurements. Yep. They look to try and find some little anomaly which appears suspicious. They completely overlook the fact that the vast majority, 99 point something percent of all these measurements are absolutely consistent. They're repeatable. Uh, they, they match exactly the methods, for, uh, the ages from other methods. They match exactly the dates uh, obtained from, uh, from stratigraphy. Oh, and I'll give you a mouth turn then. I'll give you a mouth turn. Well, you know, there's this huge body of evidence that radiometric dating does work. And I, I would like, I, I would ask you, Stephen. Yes, yes. In fact, I'd ask all of you and everyone who's yes. watching this uh, yes. subsequently on, online, on YouTube or whatever, don't take my word for it. Yes. Check it out for yourself. Go yep. to a reputable scientific library, um, yep. no weight library or Bar Smith in Adelaide or uh, <sighs> University Library. You're, you're right. Flick through the geological literature, find out what the radiometric measurements are, and yes. compare them to other radiometric measurements of the same rock. Um, maybe there are. Is there different. any way I can take an existing historic record and send that rock? It doesn't have to be uh, potassium argon because we agree that's probably not valid. Is there any other rock that I can take from a known eruption historically, send it to a laboratory, and they will match the date of that known eruption? L let's take Vesuvius back in 69 AD. What if I took a rock from the known Vesuvius eruption, send it to a laboratory, would it come back as, uh, what, 69 from now? Approximately uh, 1940 years. Would, it, would you would I expect a result of 1940 years from that great Plinian eruption of uh, 69 AD? There, there aren't many radiometric methods which which accurately deal with that young an age. They they basically there is tree it. there is tree rings though tree ring yes. evidence uh, that shows that. The, so uh, um, I'll be mentioning that in the yeah. subject. Sure. There's, well, tree there's, there's tree yeah. evidence, there's, uh, yeah. there's ice core evidence, there's, there's a whole ton of... of uh, well, can I make the other point then? We've, we've had this discussion before, Gordon. Therefore, mm -hmm. what you're really telling me is we cannot measure anything on the surface of the Earth by this because the dating is actually for what was happening down below before it erupted. So no, all these, all these dates are something that are way... No, something that happened way before. That, I, that is just a complete non sequitur. Sorry, Stephen, but it is. It is. <laughs> Look, you just told me a pyroxene, all these have started to crystallize deep down before for, it came to For surface. very, very young samples that haven't had time for the radioactive decay to be something measurable with accuracy. Yeah, that, that may be the case. But that's a very, very minuscule portion of the geological column. The vast majority of the geological column is wide open to a whole range of radiometric dating met methods which work demonstrably yeah. so. Yeah, well, can, I, can I just make a comment at this moment, please? Yes. Um, with, uh, when you actually showed the um, decay of argon, you said it was a fair way down the curve. The, um, I don't think that's true oh, no, because... No, no, I agree. What a, yeah, no, I agree totally. <laughs> We'd be right up there. So you should yeah. not... They should have come back and said there was nothing there. They should... Impossible to measure. Yeah, but, but they the, uh, Steve, the, the yeah. figures that they came up were of the order of 2 million years. Wow, um, the but the, yeah, but the half-life of um, um, your, um, uh, the potassium argon dating is 1.3 billion years so That's 2 million right. 2 million out of 1.3 billion is not a long way down the curve it's a very small oh, way down not. the curve of course not. Oh, yeah of course so, so those for those figures that they gave are not down the curve they're right at the top oh absolutely absolutely yeah. uh, all right 
Uh, just, yeah, uh, just, can I just can I just, can I just speak a bit more on that? Yeah. Um, uh, there's um, problems with um, um, laboratories in that they run multiple experiments. You can actually have a carryover from a previous experiment, <laughs> so you can get c contamination from a previous experiment, yeah. which can actually much muck up the initial uh, amount of argon. Agreed. And yeah. and so um, so these figures could be uh, a product <laughs> of um, yes. that sort of effect. What they, what Geochron, Geochron Laboratories did wrong was to put such tight tolerances on it. <laughs> yeah, because no. they, they weren't worn, and they're kind of a bit of a marketing organisation, and so they yeah. probably claim accuracies that they don't can't really guarantee. So yeah. they were probably wrong to come out with those figures. And okay. um, point. yeah, and Geochron Laboratories apparently no longer do potassium argon testing. No, no, I agree. I mean, they, they might have not, lost their reputation of uh, I think doing this sort probably of thing. <laughs> but yeah. the point being that I'm making is that, uh, look, if you've got hot rock, it might not be down um, below the, man, the mantle, but certainly even as coming up, it is very hot. Any gas such as argon, which is, as I say, is a noble gas, is going to very readily escape out of that and uh, exit from that sample before it gets to the surface. Um, that's what... Uh, you know, you, you boil any gas or boil is the wrong word. If you heat any product, something like a, an inert gas like argon is very quickly going to escape because of its, yeah. uh, because of its, its heat and its, uh, its violent uh, vibration as, uh, as it uh, vibrates its way out of the lattice. That, 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 that is the basis. does make an assumption that does make an assumption of no pressure. Yep, I uh, agree. Agreed. Good point. The, the basis of our, the oh, basis of our potassium argon testing is that while it's in a liquid state, the argon will escape, and so the oak, uh, argon will only be retained once it's solidified. Yep. Yep. It within yep. the crystal that you're measuring. Yes. Uh, and by the way, the yes, that particular laboratory wasn't equipped for doing very low levels. Of, uh, of argon, but there are methods. Uh, I think it uses um, was it a laser ablation or something like that. Um, some sophisticated method, which is incredibly accurate, and um, you're almost getting down to counting clusters of atoms with with some of the latest equipment. Okay. Uh, but but as uh, uh, as um, Kevin was already saying. The, the problem there is the carryover effect from previous measurements. Very, very difficult to get rid of when you're really dealing with a few atoms of argon to start with. Yeah, well, and also, that, also and, and that, that applies to any measurement then by any of these laboratories. Um, they could all make the same mistake. Well, can, can oh, make an observation? For very young samples, yes, for very... Uh, yeah, so you, if, if you are saying they're now got greater accuracy, can they give me that 69 AD Vesuvius? No, no, no I can't. I can't. Not accurately. Well, well they, that's, they, where, they, look, that's, that's where I come from. I come from... The tree no, rings good, uh, guys. The tree rings good. The yeah, tree rings, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It, as been stated, that this method is only really reliable uh, when you have... Um, when you're trying to measure ages comparable with the half-life. <laughs> Um, so, so you're not disapproving the old age. You're just showing that they're unreliable from trying to measure young ages. Well, yeah. that's true. But, but, but also showing there was a lot of argon in there to come up with those sorts of dates. There was no, a lot of argon. No, argument. there wasn't. Uh, the, was. the, with the, no, two, the two million years enough. corresponds to a very low um, amount of argon. Yeah, but, but that, that, con that contamination was in there by one means or another at the time it was measured. Instead of coming up with 10 years or maybe, you know, I'd look, I accept that we, in the precision they gave us, it might have been within the nearest few hundred years. We didn't get anywhere near that. We got thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Hmm. If, so it, the precision just, if we just go on to uranium lead dating, which is... Um, <laughs> Uh, Brian awesome. needs to turn his turn your volume up, Brian, because you can't can't hear can't hear you. All right, um, um, Brian can you hear me? I'm Kevin. Yeah, I can hear you, but Brian wanted to say something. Yeah, well, can I just say something on on uranium lead dating? Yes. Um, 
the range that they can measure with uranium uh, lead dating would be at the lowest 1 million and uh, up to 4.5 billion years. So this is usually performed on zircon. Uh, zircon yes. rejects lead on formation. And so the initial lead content is zero. So you've got several types of um, decay. Yeah. You've, got, or you've got uranium-238 to uh, lead 206, which is, have, has a half-life of 4.47 billion years. Turn a lot on. Um, you have um, uranium-235 to lead 207, which is a half-life yeah. of 710 yep. million years. Um, but, and both of these um, decay chains are used in what's called the Concordia diagram. And so they, they actually match one against the other. And also they, you can also measure dates from the uh, measuring the lead isotope type uh, ratios and it's called lead lead dating. So you, you got three methods <laughs> yeah. for uranium lead dating and they all converge to the same figure. So it looks as though it's pretty good. Yeah. And one of the other ones should be to check or any helium, because there shouldn't be any helium remaining. And yet in samples they took, there's still helium there. The smallest, slipperiest uh, molecule of gas and daughter uh, that, that sure shouldn't be there. there. It should well and truly have gone. Yeah, but look, I, didn't, I didn't go into this. Look, I had an hour to present. I chose this particular aspect. Uh, yes, I could have done, if we wanted to do uranium dating, I could have gone there, but I just didn't run out. And by the way, we do have guys that are much, uh, um, more capable than I for this, hopefully coming in the middle of the year. Now, sorry, Brian, did you want to say something? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Um, I think one of Steve's points with all of that is that if you take something that has been observed at a particular date, you've got something specific that you can compare against. Yeah. If you're just taking various rocks that you found in various places, uh, then you're using your various theories uh, all the way along. Uh, with no definite item that you can compare it to. So effectively, if you got this eruption took place at this particular time, uh, then you have a genuine rule that you can measure against. Now, whether you can measure accurately using potassium argon is another matter entirely, um, but that is a point there. So you're we saying we don't have independent validation? No. Uh, in, in most other circumstances, we don't. Whereas if we do have something specific uh, that we have seen, we know the date of it, uh, from observing it, uh, then we know how old that is, that we can generally compare it to, rather than just using different theories to compare to each other. Yeah. Yes, but we've got your radiocarbon, for example, with absolutely known, but precisely known historical dates. You got precisely known historical dates in, uh, in ice cores, in tree rings, in vials. And they're choosing different theories, which may very well be accurate, but they're all just uh, confirming each other to various extents rather than something definite we have before us. Well, Historic. 100% definite, known. I mean, when you have a, a volcanic eruption, very often the specific volcano ha has its own distinctive geochemical signature. And you can see that in the, in the annual ice layers of the Antarctic and Greenland and so on. Mm -hmm. yep. And you can put a precise date on it to the, to the year. Those ice layers in the Antarctic or Greenland, are they laid down annually, biannually, three monthly? Yes. Is it uniformitarianly laid down or catastrophically laid down at various times? Annually. And not only that, but there's a multitude of different ways of actually uh, verifying that they are annual. You can look so it's at. It's definitely uniformitarian in that case. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I've, I've heard other things that if you can have a big storm, it may look like an annual dump, but it was actually a very big storm that compressed because what we're talking about the compression of the ice due to a heavy layer. And then, yeah, you might not have a storm next year, but that might result in two years interpreted as one. No, the, uh, the chronology is very precise. We, we've got known dates of volcanic eruptions and they match exactly. Yep. Okay, they're known that. Yep, agreed. Uh, and and we all, we've also got uh, known dates when there was a lot of, uh, of lead mining, gold mining. So you can got, you've got lead and uh, uh, mercury vapour in the atmosphere and that rains out and you can actually match that very precisely. Uh, there's a whole multitude of, of ways of verifying that these, this chronology is correct. 
to the year. Now, admittedly, when you get down to uh, hundreds of thousands of years, we're talking about a very large ice pressure. Yeah. And at the very lowest layers, yes, you do get some blurring of the annual uh, ice rings. Um, but that doesn't invalidate the, uh, the upper layers at all. Uh, look, we, we know radiocarbon, I think, is still only good to, what, 50,000 years? I think that's correct, um, at the most. Is that correct? You can measure it up to about 60,000 years now. Yeah, uh, of that order, yes. It, it's, it's, it's of that order, yeah. But that depend that that's an assumption that the uh, because oh. radiocarbon is coming out of the uh, ionosphere when uh, the solid rays or the sorry cosmic rays are bombarding the ionosphere and causing the um, the radio the radioactive isotope to then come down. Yes. And and the uh, the historic rate at which that has changed over time has been very very studied in, in enormous detail and. Uh, yeah, creationists are always trying to, to bash radiocarbon, but in fact... Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's much the same as Al Gore, wasn't it? He had all sorts of furfies out there, too, on his uh, climate change. But look, we won't go there. All I'm saying is, um, yeah, why not find an inconvenient truth? Um, yeah. But look, I'm not the expert in this. I'm just presenting what I have and why I see this. I mean, as you know, I come from a place where I want to see the baseline, and I want to say the finished product. And I, <laughs> medical science does it that way. Uh, they, they do not go in with any presumptions. They come out exactly with no anticipated no, results. How do geologists go in with presumptions? Oh, oh, sorry. Let me turn to this skull 1470. Well, maybe, sorry, I apologise. He's not a geologist. He's a, uh, he was a um, yeah, paleontologist who was trying to prove that uh, the skull was about 1.8 million years old. Well, if we actually, yeah, well, we need to look at individual uh, cases in detail if you're going to argue that. Uh, yeah, I've got a comment on that. Um, all right, so the example that you gave with Richard Leakey looks as though yeah. they were fiddling the books. And, um, yeah. uh, and it may indeed be uh, an example of academic fraud, but examples yeah. of academic fraud do not prove that all academia is fraudulent. No, no, agreed. agreed. And and uh, and uh, fraud does not prove that the Earth is young. <laughs> no, look, I, I look, I, I accept that. But yeah. I thought isotopes were the, the bee's knees, and yet it was a theory of, in fact, it turns out a pig evolution that trumped isotope dating. Yeah, well, um, I don't know. Um, I'm just saying, yeah, I'm just saying that, uh, all right, they might have fiddled the books in this occasion, but it doesn't mean they always fiddle the books. Oh, no, 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 no. But um, I'm just saying, and, and look, we all know that as well as old earth, hand in glove is evolution. Evolution, in fact, it was very interesting, and I won't allude too much here. Astrophysicists had come up with a figure, I think it was about 1.5 billion years for the age of our universe back in, I think the late 40s or thereabouts. It was the scientists who were evolutionists uh, of life said, we cannot accept that. And then they found the iron ore meteorites that had 4.5 billion years. Um, I believe they were found out of the ocean, not obviously contaminated with anything else. And they came up with a figure of 4.5 billion years. And as far as I know, they've not actually tried to verify it again. Look, I, I might stand corrected there, but yeah. it was evolution that was driving the old age movement, not this. other sciences. I'll talk about this subsequently, but yes, that has been very, very well verified multiple times. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. I, I will wait for that one. Yeah. Yeah. From what I've gathered, that measuring rocks uh, on the earth, they've come up with figures of the order of 4 billion. But the meteorites um, gave a more accurate answer. And moon rocks also. Yeah. Mm. Um, can, we can we just move on to, um, I, I don't have much comment on Titan. Does there, anybody else got uh, comments on Titan's um, ethane? I find that really confusing. I, don't, I, uh, I, I think Titan's a huge red herring. Okay, okay, so there are young features. We know that the rings of Saturn are young. We know that at least some of the moons are young. And we know that out there near the edge of our solar system, things like um, 
stray bodies from the Kuiper belt yeah. sometimes come in and get caught up in the gravitational trap and, and they disintegrate and and they and they mess up the, the local cosmology in the vicinity of that planet. But what's that got to do with the age of the Earth? Nothing. Well, I'm just saying, oh, look, let me let me quote here. I'll just go to slide which one, the Enigma one, um, where this is uh, NASA itself quotes um, in Titans, the right at the bottom port, port, port point, uh, but sunlight irreversibly destroys methane after tens of million years. So something has replenished methane in Titan's thick air during the moon's 4.5 billion year history. That's what NASA says. What's wrong with that, though? Uh, well, yeah, that's assuming that Titan is 4.5 billion years old. Well, that's what NASA's telling me. Well, uh, we don't, we don't bit, know. Look. There's no sound science to say that. Um, I, I guess I come from a physics background. There's quite but a... Einstein was brilliant. He predicted things and they happened. <laughs> he told us, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen a bubble chamber, you know, that uh, a fast incoming, um, uh, uh, what would I call it, um, uh, something from one of the uh, solar rays or a, a particle coming in from outer space split <laughs> into... Neutrino. So, yeah, yeah. And it, uh, you could see that in the bubble chamber, going at a fraction, a reasonable fraction of the speed of light, it lasted much longer than it would at one of these uh, other chambers here on Earth, if we were producing it here. You could see that uh, the life was extended. Uh, we know that uh, general relativity was proven. We've recently had the gravitational experiments from way out in outer space, that um, Einstein predicted things and they were found to be true. Like the speed of light. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the speed of light is constant. But yeah, that's right. Yeah, but, but he, well, we all knew about the speed of light. Michelson Morley experiment back about 1880 proved that no matter where the Earth was, um, it didn't matter. There was no such thing as ether. Uh, the speed of light was always assigned to any observer. That was the one thing that was constant. And from that, yeah, well, the, probably the worst thing uh, he predicted was it was NC squared. That's what Hiroshima and Nagasaki found out. But he predicted it and it proved correct. So that's the sort of science that I look for where you get predictions and in due course, it takes a while, you'll see that the results are proved. But, but, yeah, but, but if, if the, when, when that fails, like if you make a prediction and it fails, yeah. then, you, then the correct response is to go back and scratch your head and, course, yeah. and um, uh, reconsider what went wrong. Yeah, so, well, look, as I said, there were two things about Titan. One, there were no oceans, despite their predictions. Secondly, um, well, in fact, three things. Secondly, um, the if it was 4.5 billion years old, and that's the slide I've got up now, then almost all the methane should have been, it should have disappeared. But it was created, well, they're now saying, oh, well, we must, they change the story. Okay, methane what must. About, what about a meteor crashing in like what Gordon said, coming in from, I mean, there's so many different, <laughs> Of scenarios that it could have brought that methane into the into the um, pool of well, they, they, I, I can assure you they've certainly mapped Titan quite well, and I don't think they've seen. I've, I've read of no uh, impact craters uh, that would be equivalent to a methane, you know, so a meteorite. Um, what I'm suggesting is that uh, a KBO, a Kuiper Belt object. Yes. could have been captured and that because of um, uh, all the gravitational goings on around, close to Saturn, it's a, it's a big planet, a lot of mass, um, and it's within the Roche limit, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to break up, there's going to be all sorts of uh, processes which we've barely even begun to look at now. Yeah. You're, you're talking about predictions, there were no predictions, there were speculations, we know very little about yeah. the origin of Titan or Saturn at this stage. We do know that there are moons with retrograde orbits, very strange orbits. We do know that the, uh, the angle of inclination of the ring is very strange. It yes. all seems to imply there's been a very act dynamic and active uh, history to the planet, which we don't know much about it. So um, is, to say that there were you know, 4.5 billion year uh, predictions, uh, a, a, a prediction of that sort of history. That's, that's just speculation. We don't know that yet. So but we're now saying that NASA, NASA are speculators. 
No, in, so that's in, what I said. I, I, did, I, 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 did, I deliberately chose words direct that from the next statement. statement cannot be justified. We don't know I, that. There is no evidence to support that. Well, regarding, the belt, has, no. regarding the so-called Kuiper Belt, has Voyager got out far enough to actually see it? What, the KBO? KBO belt? Mm. Um, not or is it still just uh, a theory to explain uh, what we see? KB, um, I don't know whether it was Voyager or one of the others. That I know, I know the ones, New Horizons, it passed Pluto, and then Atherothels, and they've given a new name to the first it, of the KBOs it found. It's the big it's double out. bubble one, and it's gone out, um, and it's now looking at others, yeah. I'm thinking it, they're, they're looking at uh, two or three close flybys with these satellites. Yep. But, yep. you know, using the... Um, uh, what's that space telescope thing? The uh, the Hubble te uh, well, James Webb. James Webb is just now being tuned, so and, that uh, gives a good you know, They've found quite a few KBOs now. There's more. Yeah. There's yeah. rapidly mounting evidence that the Kuiper Belt is huge, and that you know it, it goes out way beyond the the orbit of Pluto, uh, yeah. and a yeah. massive amount, thousands, tens of thousands, probably, of these large. KBOs are out there. They're just uh, the colour of coal and very small and very hard to spot by any kind of telescope. Uh, well, Atheroth, I think, was rather orangey red, if I recall. Um, it's the one they have flown by. Um, but yeah, uh, look, I agree with you, uh, Gordon. There's a lot of work to be done out there. And in fact, it's one of the reasons Pluto was demoted to a small planet was they found something even bigger than Pluto out there. Yeah. And suddenly Pluto couldn't, we well, needed a tenth planet by then, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but look, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, on the on the point of uh, Saturn's rings, like the yeah. um, you know, current theories say that the Saturn's rings are of the order of a hundred million years. Ten to a hundred. Ten to hundred. Yeah, ten hundred or, or less. But what's that got to do with the age of Saturn? <laughs> well, I, I'm just trying to say that there's a number of things. It's not just one. It wasn't just Titan. Uh, you've got Eucladius, um spitting out of all that. Um, look, and that in itself, uh, a 4.5 year old planet that's very quickly should have um, ejected a lot of that material. But look, I'm not going there. I'm just saying what I could quote from that the amount of matter that's coming out there that's accumulated on the other planets uh, from the E ring itself and also possibly directly coming out of uh, Ecclesiastes is probably accumulated in less than 200 million years. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm trying to tell you. Uh, the Saturn system as a whole, rings, uh, at least a group of planets, do not look like they're 4.5 billion years old. Absolutely agree with you. But what's that got to do with the age of the Earth? Uh, well, uh, I hear over and over again, our solar system is 4.5 billion years old. Basically, so, uh, but that doesn't mean that everything in it is 4.6 billion years old. I just oh, turned that's... 70, so that's a bit short. <laughs> well, look, I, if I'd known this angle, I would have focused more on the Earth, but I just knew that, uh, well, I knew Cassini. I mean, I'm, I'm space nerd. I'll, I'll acknowledge that. So as I, you know, as I followed it from its launch and uh, saw stuff happening, and uh, it certainly came up because uh, in many scientific results, I showed it to you, it actually says, here we go, um, NASA says, Titan's thick air during the moon's 4.5 billion year history. That's oh, NASA's statement, not mine. Okay, well, I dispute with that particular statement by one particular NASA scientist. I don't necessarily dispute most of what NASA says. Okay, well, certainly as I do read, like as I say, space nerd, you will often find references to the solar system being 4.5 billion years old. It is. We're all supposed to emerge from the same uh, disk of uh, matter that formed in our solar system. So we're all about the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, Except uh, it's only about 70. Um, <laughs> I, I um, talked over the top of Tom at one stage. Um, Tom, did you actually, were you trying to say something? <laughs> You're gone. <laughs> I was just um, noodling over how much of the observations actually are going to, like of gathering the data are going to actually rely on and then try and contradict both relativity and the um 
and the standard model of particle physics, which is being used not only right now for us to communicate, but to actually gather the pictures and the data that uh, Stephen's using anyway. Um, and so I just sort of started looking at that. I mean, yeah. we'll talk about it a little bit more once we get to the cosmology section, but it, it's, it's, really, it's really very interesting to think about how right the physics has to be, because otherwise we couldn't be using Zoom in the first place. And you certainly, yeah. certainly couldn't be collecting the pictures that, um, no. uh, that are being collected. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, does anybody have comments on uh, uh, what uh, Steve said about relativity? Well, I know that there's some, you know, this is from a, a lay person's perspective. The sun is eight mi minutes. The light from the sun takes eight minutes to get to us. Yes. So, I am, and obviously planets are not much further away. So, and they've done lots of tests to show that it's consistent. So yeah. the light speed is a huge flaw in the argument. Um, I can appreciate what you're saying in that slide because I've seen it before, yeah. um, but it doesn't to me convince the fact that they're taking multiple different tests of lots of different things and they all come back with the same answers you know they all show that the speed of light is the speed of light is the same you know so, i fully agree fully agree the speed of light. i'm sorry if i meant if i'm mistaken there and i apologize Bronwyn. speed yeah, of light well, will always so be from that then we should be able to um, measure the distance that the planets are from us okay yes and some of them are you know, millions of years away. So I can't see how they, how they can argue that if that light, you know, speed doesn't change, how they can... Planet, sorry, are we talking about planets here? No. Do you no, talk about... Cosmology. For, for, yeah, for yeah, instance... Cosmology. Uh, for, uh, yeah. Andromeda, you can see. And Andromeda yeah. is um, two million uh, light years away. <laughs> yeah, so the yeah. common sense would say to you that the what we are observing is what happened two million years ago. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. If, well, if it's not just common sense, it, it's it's that that is the star distant starlight problem that young Earth creationists actually grapple with, and there's been a whole host of of explanations, most of which are sort of discarded as we discover more and more. It's well, getting you, it's get, you, getting to be more and more just those stories. Well, sorry, Tom, but can I turn to slide forty six? Could you explain? The quasars next to the um, uh, galaxies. Uh, no, I, I, no, that, well, yeah, that's not quite exactly. the same problem. But uh, yeah, well, the like redshift is no, completely no. different. Redshift is well, quite well. But, but there's there's three ways of measuring the the size and the age of the universe. One is the Cepheid variable stars. Uh, yep. Another is uh, redshift, and the third is the cosmic microwave background. And all of those, although there is a little bit of a difference right at the moment between the um, uh, between using the the, uh, set of the standard candles yes. and the um, Hubble constant right at the moment, which is which is very very interesting, um, yeah. but largely they're all they're all in 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 um, in agreement, and they're certainly not six thousand years. Okay, well, Tom. Okay, Tom. Would you agree then the universe is not 13.5 million years, a billion years old, but is it actually 27 billion years old because the cosmic background radiation is almost exactly precise from one, we look in one direction, look the other, they're almost exactly the same. If the, uh, uh, when the singularity suddenly exploded, surely the variations is it radiated out and you would expect to see a variation in one direction from perhaps another direction. But if there was so, uh, what's the right word, so mixed that you could actually get the same temperature in opposite side of a $13.5 million radius, uh, not billion dollars. Yeah, billion. that's the homogeneity yeah. problem for which cosmic inflation is proposed as the solution. Now, I'm a little bit of a doubter on the cosmic inflation. Yeah, because it means you uh, have to go few, fast on the speed of light. Right? You, you would have to expand it faster than the speed of light. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but there's no rule about that. In fact, the 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 you can actually nothing can travel through space, and the and the speed of light is also the speed of causality. So space yeah. can actually expand. There's no salute. There's no there's no actual limit to that. In fact, I don't know what the Hubble 
approximately if I can't I can't actually um uh uh say where that is compared to the speed of light um I'm only a lay person on this stuff but it, it's a case of how much of this has to be wrong that we actually use every day um the mobile phone um uh, yeah. adjustments that get yeah. made uh, from predictions from general relativity you yeah. talked about LIGO earlier the, the gravitational waves so much has to be wrong um and and I'm prepared for I'm, I'm quite happy that some of us wrong like I don't know if we live in an A theory or a B theory of time meaning Einstein predicted like a a, a sandwich or like a CD time is like a CD everything exists Yes. And so the beginning of the universe would be like the front edge is how William Lane Craig just describes it, I think probably quite accurately. Whereas in the A theory of time, the front edge doesn't exist. In the beginning, everything started um, and came into existence, something he calls temporal becoming. So there are, there are, there are I think you, 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 you named rightly, or you mentioned as you were speaking, a couple of things that I... Or, or, or glance through a couple of things that I think are open questions, but but the fact that you could get the universe as six thousand years, so much has to be broken for that to be true. Well, I'll look, I, I, I mean, I'll just explain the one big difference. We know that our solar system runs largely on Newtonian dynamics, um, with a little bit of tweak from uh, Einstein. That's why that we don't have Vulcan. Uh, orbiting in front of Mercury, uh, okay, but it's largely Newtonian, you, with the outer planets moving much, much, much slower than the inner planets, which have to offset the gravity uh, that is, is that much stronger close in. You go to the any of the galaxies, I think, starting with Andromeda, and you find that's not the same. The outer arms of those galaxies are moving, if not as fast, almost as fast as this inner spiral of those galaxies. Suddenly, Newtonian physics, which explains how our current our proximate uh, solar system is working, uh, does not apply, it seems, to the galaxies. That's, well, that's not, that that's not assuming, postulated. That, no, that, that's wrong. You're assuming yeah. that the arms of the galaxy are what's actually moving. Yeah, that's not quite no. right. You, what, okay. you, what you have yeah. is looking at the red gas yeah pressure wave moving through the galaxy, uh, which, is a, which is much, much faster than the, most of the matter in the galactic arms themselves. Uh, but can I come back to, um, you mentioned the relativistic time dilation, yep. Which, yep. which is just full of uh, logical inconsistency. There are two ways to dilate uh, uh, time. One is gravitationally, Yes. Which, in order for a significant change in time to happen, you have to be pretty close to a black hole. In which, yep. you know, if that had been the case, we'd have been swallowed up long ago and we wouldn't be here to talk about it. The other way is by stretching the actual fabric of space time itself. Um, and there's nothing in any of the creationist. Uh, hypotheses which really explains how that works, where that works, uh, at what point uh, away from Earth as the center of the universe does that actually take place and does it include the sun or the moon or the stars and when did it happen? Uh, uh, look, I'm so, sorry if I may, John, John Hartnett is a practicing or was a practicing cosmologist, I know he's yes. Yes, he's, he's, he's one of two people who come up with these time dilation theories. The theories mm. themselves are different, and each person's theory might, uh, is modified as uh, almost as fast as someone comes up with an, an objection to it. None of it actually makes sense. Um, and even if it was true that the outer edges of the universe were somehow massively accelerated by time dilation, that doesn't affect what's happening here on Earth. And yep. the processes here on Earth indicate billions of years of Earth history. Not, 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 not at the same degree of formality that I'm used to in testing aircraft, where I know the baseline, I know the other, or in fact, in medical science, where they do, they, they test without any known presumptions. And we've seen the presumptions um, 
So, in other places. So hang on, hang on. I want to I want to come in on that one a little bit. Yeah, because you're saying that's what the scientists do, and yet um, you, we're the geologists and um, uh, yeah. etc. And yet that is exactly what the young Earth creation, the the one or two scientists who are offering relativistic sort of get out of jail cards. That is exactly what they're doing. They're going. We know the Bible is correct. Therefore. Um, uh, literally, we need, we know that we need a literal interpretation of the Bible. Therefore, how do we adjust our science uh, appropriately? I just think you need to be a little careful with that. Yeah. You, well, look, the, I, I you... agree. But, yeah. I, look, I agree that, uh, and I've specifically not look. I, I think there's good evidence of a major flood uh, with about four thousand, no, two thousand. Yeah, about just over four thousand years ago. Um, both from the evidence that I showed you was the no uh, very rapid lay down, et cetera, et cetera, but we won't go too far on that one. It's prior to that that I agree that the evidence has to go elsewhere. Um, but if, for instance, the Big Bang people say there was this rapid expansion, super expansion within the first few microseconds or whatever in order to mix up all the things, surely a rapid expansion on day four of the is just as legitimate for us as it is for the people that uh, postulate the Big Bang. Day four. That, uh, day four is when the stars were created. If you had rapid expansion, remember at that stage it was only grass, vegetation. If there was no humans on board. We would have we weren't we weren't even created it. You would have had a rapid expansion of the universe, which uh, if we were near the, the center of the whatever it was, the singularity or whatever it's going to call it. We would have had a much slower time frame than the stars disappearing out and all their interactions and the creation of galaxies and all that sort of stuff. So our time scale would have been much slower than that of uh, the rest of the units, which we now observe at a slower rate, just as the Big Bang people say um, yeah. as well, uh, where we see events that appear to be, you know, yes, 13.5 billion years old. But, but the opening That's time -wise. The opening verse of the Bible is um, God created the heavens and the earth, the yep. heavens, as in yep. the stars. Yep. So they were created on day one. No, 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 please. That's that's day four. Read that. It's day four. Now, now the heavens, when we say the heavens, you mean the actual material matter. Look, it could have been a very complete, it's a singularity. The heavens and the earth is translated in Hebrew, in Hebrew as universe. Yep, and I agree. It might have been a very compressed so, universe. It, so, I... Uh, you know, like it, week after week when I'm in church, the pastor will say, you know, the, the Hebrew word for this, the Hebrew word for that, the Greek word for this, the Greek word for that. It's universe. So I, I can't see how you can say, bring, postulate that from that. Oh, I'm stars sorry. No, I'm sorry. Have you not read the sequence? Stars appear on day four. The, the, no. the two lights and then the other stars appear on yeah, day four. Yeah, that's to the observer on the earth, not to, um, yeah. not yeah. to the... Universe. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, because verse one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So yeah. that, and that's translated as universe. So that's everything. Oh, that's okay. Universe. That's not necessarily oh. day one. Sorry, I want to back off. Sorry, Brom. I'll back off a bit there. Yeah. Yes, that's an introductory statement. And then the remaining ones tell you the sequence which that creation happened. Oh well, yeah. you know, can we get into can we get into that another night? Yeah, well, look, that, that's can I yeah. say that's yeah. a middle of the year. We're deliberately delaying that one to the middle of the year. Yeah, I'll let yeah. Brian take lead on that one. Um, Steve, just a general comment in your whole argument. Your whole yep. argument seems to be based on critiquing old Earth dating methods. Yeah, but okay. uh, have you have but uh, like uh, they do have kind of have a set of um, arguments where they converge on common time frames. What have oh, you look. got? What have you got for uh, uh, a YEC view? Uh, have you got a series yeah. of uh, experiments that point oh, look, to oh, a, a common date for the origin of the universe from a YEC view? Uh, that's going to. I'm not going to say. Well, we know it's. Uh, well, I showed it to you. It was on the uh, front page of the Jerusalem Post. But no, no. But, 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 but that, that's a biblical argument. It's not a scientific. Yeah, that's argument. right. So yeah, I'm going to. Right. I'm yeah. going to show you. Young Earth. First of all, we'll start with the island of Circe. In 20 years, it had vegetation and topsoil. Uh, and then I'll go to Catherine Gorge, 
no evidence of anything laid that all got laid down very rapidly. There was no evidence of any erosion or stuff between. Simpson's Gaff, yes, I have heard um, that perhaps the earth itself rose up there, but uh, to me, uh, I'm used to having a, uh, yeah. um, you know, as I say, a, a watershed. What about the canyon formed in one day. Yeah, but, as, but, yeah, but, but yeah. These, these do not give you um, a scientific okay. argument for um, working out the uh, time for the origin of the universe yeah, from a yet yeah. point of view. None of these do. I didn't that, that's a good point actually is this right. like this is a neg you're making the negative case and doing the defensive oh, sorry. Well, what is there to show show the positive oh, oh, well, okay i thought we were talking about look I, I must confess i look at our solar system as one whole lot and given that i was limited to about one hour or thereabouts i specifically did you know i'm a space nerd so i chose what i know quite recently we discovered in the saturnian system that there is a lot of indication on the Saturnian system of a very, well, quite young, and I'm not using my terms, these are young coming out of um, uh, scientific papers, young noise. system. Um, so if Saturn is young, relatively young, 10 to 100 million years, um, why shouldn't the rest of the system be that long? And as I say, my major area is I think that um, as we look at the possibility and look, um, I, I hear what they say about uh, radioactive, but I want to see something they can date of a known historic event. When they can, then I will certainly say, right, I, I might be wrong, but at the moment, I want to see it. From my own experience of what I practice in my, I guess, my professional career uh, and what I've observed, as I say, medical, I want to see conclusive results. Like, like I do in the chemistry, I know I can start a particular Com, you know, compound or, or combine two uh, uh, different substances and I know what I'll get. I want to see the start and the end and expect to see that. Can we demonstrate that anywhere for yes. an age? Where? <laughs> um, with the tree rings. They can show the evidence of, of volcanic eruptions in it. And you're talking oh, yeah. no, about 20,000 years ago. Uh, 20,000 years? Okay. Uh, look, I'll, I'll have to see that because actually I know... Uh, a creationist guy who was actually did uh, tree ring experiments down in southern Tasmania. Uh, they use softwoods because the softwood um, cells in tree rings grow faster than hardwood, which is going to wait a lot longer. So the results, and uh, uh, he didn't indicate any a doubt of his faith in the young earth. Mm, yeah. He's actually with the CSIRO, so he's not a, a scientist employed by uh, Creation Ministries or anything. He's actually a CSIRO so scientist. I'll provide you with some known historic dates. Uh, sure. Yeah. And, and that's, look, yes, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Appreciate that. Um, um, we've, now, we've now gone past uh, 9 p.m. There's no um, uh, law written in stone to say that we can't. Um, but um, um, all right. Uh, I'll, um, would you like to continue on? <laughs> and, and, and just people just a got couple of points. Yeah. Can I just right at the beginning, I just made a point that I couldn't see on the questions. Where are they? Um, you know, um, not, I mean, some people could find this a little bit offensive. That's why I'm bringing it up, is that when you talked about Eric, right, someone who I admire a yeah. lot, yeah. right, um, I said, I'm not really following why honouring the Lord on the seventh day, as Eric did, yeah. um, has to do with scientific evidence of a young earth. No. People can hold an old earth and still old earth opinion or view and still hold to the Sabbath as being sacred. Yeah. To, and I'll make another point. Seven yeah. days to humans is very different to seven periods to God, okay? He's an eternal being. Right, we're not. So you can't really bring that argument in, like you know that God's in on a different time frame to us. And and besides it, Eric was in here. You know, I mean, God, I, I love the bloke, but you know, it doesn't really matter whether he was old Earth or young Earth, really, ultimately. But um, you know, I just think that bringing that into the debate is a bit. 
you know, tenuous, wow. you know, it's disrespectful, true. actually. You know, oh, it just I'm says sorry. that he had an old, a young earth view because that's what his era and, you know, I mean, I've been decades in a church that had a young earth view, um, yeah. but I don't disrespect those people any less. Um, sure. It's just the view they hold, you know. So, um, yeah, the fact that he didn't want to run on a Sunday is separate to whether or not he actually held an old earth, a young earth view or not. Well, just give me an example of Albert Einstein. He had pictures of uh, Isaac Newton, um, Michael Faraday, and I believe it was James mm. uh, Clark Maxwell on his, and he certainly revered them, um, all young Earth creationists. I wouldn't say about that about Isaac Newton, but I'm not sure about the other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Ultimately, um, the young earth creationists are not going to change their views no matter what the evidence and the old age uh, uh, protagonists, they're not going to change their views because they're looking at the evidence. Ultimately, yeah, I'm looking at the evidence too. The, the, only thing, the only thing that we should be looking at is the interpretation of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And should we look at that as uh, an 18th century um, absolute inerrant literal text or should we be looking at it as a an ancient uh, 3,000 year old plus uh, Hebrew uh, allegory and, and oh, well, please include the fourth commandment given on uh, the uh, and the commandments because that specifically gives us a seven day week the French Revolution tried to change it and they failed yeah, uh, anyway, uh, this is not the topic that uh, we're looking yeah. at, but th those are um, uh, meetings four and five. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, okay. um, okay. so um, the agreement, or no, not the agreement, my edict <laughs> yes. was that the first yeah. two talks would um, discuss um, the scientific arguments. Then I'm um, doing the pastoral's consideration where I try to kind of get you all under control. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> then the fourth and fifth, we're going to look at the uh, biblical arguments uh, either way. So we'll leave it to that night, those nights. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Yeah. Right. Not surprising, Kevin, that we uh, start <laughs> this first um, presentation was um, as robust as it was. Oh, I, I don't think it's been too bad, really. Yeah, you okay. did your presentation, and um, um, I think you've uh, been subject to some um, uh, yeah. a fair, a fair few challenges, and you've taken yeah. it in fairly good grace. So um, nice. good on you. Um, you. But um, yeah, so um, um, I, th I think at this point here, I, I, I'm not necessarily um, uh, going to uh, stop the meeting. But I, I might stop the recording soon. Yeah. There's there's some uh, there's some people who haven't actually made a contribution. Um, is there anybody else who would like to make a contribution while we're still on the record? <laughs> what are you gleefully <laughs> laughing about, Gordon? I'm just inviting Elaine to make a comment, but she's ticking. <laughs> <laughs> then she's what? <laughs> she's chickening out. Oh, she's chilling out, is she? All right, I'll stop the recording now. So uh, thank, uh, uh, formally, thank you very much, Steve, for your presentation. And thank you for all the participants uh, who joined in the discussion. And uh, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge yet. We've yeah. got it. A... Yeah. All right. So I need um, to point out something. Yeah. Can I just point out something? Yeah. yeah. If you read the chat, Josh has just gone, I better hit if. What? I better so hit he's if. He's a real key, <laughs> even with his spelling. Yeah. <laughs> See you, folks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Bye.